about to present Vincent Carrazzo! Hey everybody, how you doing? Wow, that's a hot mic. Yeah, awesome. Hey guys, how y'all doing? Yeah. Having a good time? Yeah. Awesome, I've met a lot of you guys already. This is uh, great, man. What a great convention it is. Good weather, good turnout. Um, all right, let's get it going. Let's get it started. What do you guys want to talk about? He you want to take questions? questions? Yeah. Oh, all right. I'll ask, I'll ask. Here we go. I think Jeremy's here. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions about the last 15 minutes all or right. so. It's like, it's like Trivial Pursuit with Vince Carrazzo. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It, who, let me ask you, who here was at the panel yesterday? With me. All right. So, some returnees right so we, got, we got some returnees. So we're going to try to bring up some, some new material today. Okay, cool. But we're also going to talk about some of the stuff from yesterday as well. Sure. All right, so let me ask you, what is your favorite project you ever worked on? Uh, as a voice actor or as an on-camera actor? Anything. Um, I guess uh, I'll say as an on-camera actor, uh, one of my favorite projects was uh, Bonanno, a Godfather story. I played Lucky Luciano, uh, which was kind of cool. It was a miniseries that won an Emmy. Um, and uh, it was just cool to play uh, such an iconic uh, figure, historic figure, uh, and just to learn about that. Plus, the, you know, there was some prosthetic stuff with the eye. And, um, which was cool. It was just cool getting into character and uh, a cool project. Um, and as a voiceover actor, that's tough. I, I like them all. I mean, there's just something, there's something sort of um, personal about all of them that you know you bring to the table. Um, I mean, of course, I have a, a, a major soft spot for Tuxedo Mask and Darian because it's such a. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is why a lot of you guys are here. <laughs> I think that's part of the reason why I have a soft spot for it. When I see your faces and I see uh, you know the fans, you just it just I know how much it means to you guys. And uh, it was a pretty awesome show to be a part of. The cast was amazing. It was a great group of people that some of them are still great friends to this day. I've known them for like 20 years. And, um, so I think that's uh, one of the main reasons for for Sailor Moon and Tuxedo Mask, and also. Um, uh, I, I really enjoyed playing Shigadance and Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Uh, <laughs> just because I was the youngest cast member, I was 22 at the time, it was my very first animated job, and I played uh, the oldest cat, uh, guy in the cast, uh, Shigadance, and it was a fun voice, you know, to be 22 years old and being like, Ventura, I can hear him in this scratching around. <laughs> the rent is due, Ventura. It was, uh, it was a fun voice to play, and I actually ended up uh, doing a reading with uh, the gentleman who played the role in the movie, and I'm terrible, it's his, his name's gone out of my head, he's an iconic, no, no, not Jim Carrey, no, the guy who played Chicken Nets. Um, he's a great character actor, he's been in tons of films, and uh, we actually sat beside each other at a table, we were doing a reading for a, a feature. Um, and so we and I ended up telling him about it. He just said, and the whole time he just kept looking at me as I was telling the story. And then as soon as I finished, he just went, "But you're so young." <laughs> <laughs> so that that was kind of cool. And I think that uh, I also have the soft spot for that role because it's the very first animated job I ever did. It's my very first role that I played. I just graduated from Ryerson University in Toronto. So thanks, Alex. Um, Alex. So I had a soft spot for that. Uh, on camera, the other role that I, sh I, I always like to mention is I was the last detective <laughs> to join the force on NYPD Blue. So I was in the very final episode of the series, which was, which was pretty awesome, man. And it was quite an honor to be. So, and they, the, the cast was so amazing because they really embraced me and made me feel like I was part of their, you know, group. Even though I was just like the last detective for one episode, the very the season finale, the series finale. Um, but they were so nice, and Dennis Franz, and just, uh, the entire cast was just really, really sweet and, and great. And I, I, I felt like I was part of the team, you know. And I kept saying the whole time we were shooting, and I was like, Dude, "Can we just maybe do one more season?" <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right. The next question that I have is for people who may not be uh, uh, familiar with all the work you've done. Could you go ahead and list some of the highlights from your resume uh, that? For, for some people like that may know you from uh, Tuxedo Masks, they may not know you from a few other things. Sure. Um, some of you probably are fans of Kingdom Hearts. Yeah! yeah. 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 Exactly. In that. Um, I hate doing this. I hate this part. <laughs> so, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> so where it's like the laundry list. It is my resume. 
Um, I was, I mentioned, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. I was Shaky Dance. I was Alden Jones on Brace Face uh, for two seasons. Um, uh, I just, I, Tuxedo Mask, of course, and Jackal Johnson and the Cheetah Girls. Uh, you guys know the Cheetah Girls from Disney. Yeah, the Jackal keeps it real. <laughs> Uh, I did a lot of Disney shows. Uh, I was Plunkett in Jet Jackson, famous Jet Jackson. I was uh, Albert in a movie called Quince, but uh, Cheetah Girls is one of the bigger ones. Um, Bride of Chucky, I don't know if you guys are fans of Woo! Chucky. Yeah! Jennifer Tilly sliced my neck open. I was covered in uh, red dye for a couple days. And, uh, <laughs> that was an interesting role. Um, <laughs> I remember that, the scene, they wanted to do an extreme close up. The, the uh, DOP of the movie uh, is Ronnie, I believe it's Ronnie Wu, who was the DOP from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, or Hidden Dragon, Crouching Tiger's movie. Can I get that right? It's the opposite. I do that all the time. Is it Crouching Tiger, Hidden? It's not the Hidden Tiger and the Crouching Dragon. <laughs> all right, something's hidden, something's crouching. Right? It's a dragon, it's a tiger. Um, and uh, they wanted to do this extreme close up to open it. Uh, of me smoking the cigarette and you know, as I light the lighter and then they were panning really slowly as I take this huge drag and we must have shot like at least 20 takes and honestly I was I turned green from the smoke from some sucking in all that smoke and they had to powder me down and put so much makeup on so that I didn't look like I was about to throw up so and then right after that they sliced my neck open and I had to hang out of the car and have blood pouring in my face so uh, always fun Anyways, those are some of the highlights. I'm sure there's other stuff that you guys know, and I, I you know, I, I always get embarrassed when I have to list the stuff. <laughs> oh, no, and, and in one of the earlier panels, we were, uh, we were actually talking about theater, and we actually had a little talk about this yesterday on our own. Like, I kind of bring it, bring it back to this, just because as a theater theater man myself, I have absolute love for it. We actually have a place in common, mm -hmm. Starlight Theater up in Kansas City, Missouri. Yes, uh, yes. And could you tell us a little bit some of the theater shows you've done as well? Well, I'm uh, a theater graduate of acting from Ryerson University in Canada, uh, with honors. <laughs> I like to always add that. It means I didn't suck. <laughs> and um, uh, I, when I first graduated, I did uh, a lot of theater, and I actually thought all I would do was theater. I, I, my plan was to go to Stratford in Canada. I don't know if you guys know Stratford. Uh, and, and, uh, it's just outside. It's outside of London. In Toronto, it's an iconic uh, theater. They do Shakespearean plays, and that's what I thought I would do for most of my life. And then suddenly, I started doing voiceovers and on camera. And went, this is way more cool. Um, you know, I mean, there's nothing like playing Macbeth and King Lear and Hamlet, but yeah. <laughs> but, but the, I, I, my passion became voiceover and on camera. Uh, and I've done musical theater, and recently, a couple years ago, my wife and I uh, we toured uh, the U.S. doing Mamma Mia. The National Tour wow. of yeah. I played Harry Bright, the British dad, uh, uh, which was fun. I got to play the guitar, I got to be on stage with my wife. It was a pretty amazing time. And I actually, I had been away from theater for almost 10 years. I hadn't been on a stage in 10 years. And uh, that was my comeback to the stage. And I uh, debuted at the Starlight Theater in Kansas City, which is an 8,000 seat outdoor theater. And uh, it was pouring rain that night. Uh, and all you could hear was like just the pounding rain on the audience, and then uh, some. They had they brought in a busload of people, and somebody started. Free they, we heard this screaming in the background. <laughs> it, was, it was the wildest night to come back to the stage, pitch black, with rain pouring down, singing, doing Mamma Mia, and I was just like, wow, this is wild. Eight thousand people. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was a, that was a blast. It was amazing to do that. And then I closed it in Wolf Trap uh, in front of nine thousand people. The tour. We closed the tour. Two outdoor theaters, which are pretty cool. Yeah, I love the stage. I don't know if any of you are stage people, but uh, support the theater. <laughs> All right. The qu next question I have is: How is it hard to transition going from a voice or er, from a traditional uh, ha having a traditional background in theater into uh, a genre of, of acting, which just really is from your neck up? Because, like, I'm, I'm sure when you're in the the voice studio, you have to have the emotions on your face because it's reflected through the, through the microphone. So how is it different than, uh, from, how is it different making the transition from being a, a traditional actor into a voice actor? Gotcha. Uh, I think what Jeremy's trying to say is that I have the face that's perfect behind, to be behind a microphone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's actually a great question. Um, 
You know, I often say that there is no difference in terms of creating a role. You still approach it from creating the character. You're still, um, you know, you still want to find the motivation for the character. What does that character want? What's, uh, what's stopping that character from getting what they want? Um, so those sort of uh, aspects are always the same. And if you can raise those stakes high enough, then you create more drama. You, you know, we're always, conflict is the heart of everything that we do because without conflict, there's no interest. And we always want to, you know, villains. The, the simplest way is, you know, in a lot of the video games or a lot of animated stuff, it's, you know, superheroes and villains. Um, but, you know, in regular life, it's also finding the conflict in relationships and stuff, and that's what makes us interested. That's what makes us care about these characters and why we, you know, relate to them so much. So that element is always the same to me as an actor. I mean, I always approach it that way. Um, but of course, uh, with on camera, you know, you are. Uh, it's it's all aspects. It's there's the physical part of acting. There's the subtext that's played out. You know, that you the things that you don't say that you are saying with your body. In voiceover, you don't have that uh, luxury at all. So, subtext sometimes is really subtle. You have to play it in your voice. So you know, uh, and so so there are some very technical things that you learn to create uh, in terms of creating tension or conflict or you know even if it's even if it's not a, a heavily con conflicted scene. You know, there's ways to manipulate your voice to bring out you know to, to almost show like pain and suffering. You know, or you tighten the, the voice. And, so there's a lot of technical aspects that you learn over time, which is which is really cool. Um, and of course, the other thing which is amazing about being a voice actor is you get to do things sometimes that you could never ever do. Um, you know, I I could never play. I, no one would hire me to be Shika Dance in Ace Ventura when I was 22 years old, right? I mean, they hired that gentleman who was 70 years old. But as a 22 year old, there I am doing Ventura. I can hear them in there scratching around. <laughs> You, know, you get to play things that you could never play in real life. Um, that's the beauty of being a, a voiceover actor. You know, you get to throw magical roses that somehow <laughs> save the world. <laughs> so that's uh, that's one of the coolest things I, I have to say about voice acting. Um, but the transition, there, there are there are a lot of technical things, and you know, if anybody's interested in doing voiceover, I would highly recommend taking some classes and stuff because being in front of a microphone and learning how to manipulate the mic is. Um, uh, is a big part of doing what we do. I hope that answers the question. Oh, that did. That did. All right, the next question that I have, uh, actually, just a second, I saw someone raising their hand. All right, we're going to do a Q&A session for about the last 15 minutes of this panel, and then following that, he's going to be doing a autograph and picture taking uh, a session right over where the Cutie Mark Cafe is, is going on, where they're selling the face as well. So that's a perfect chance to kind of go over there Meet him, ask him some questions. Right now, I'm just going to be asking a few, a few more questions up here, okay? Yeah, let's do it. All right, the next question I had was, when when you're working in a uh, voice studio, how, how, how do you come about really developing a, a character when, like, if, you, if, you, if, you're an act, uh, if you're doing a theater show, for instance, you can act, act out the part where when you're doing a, a Video game, for instance, where you only know a certain uh, certain uh, aspects of, of, of the scene or what's going on. How do you use that to actually develop your characters? Um, you see what I'm asking? Uh, I think so. With, with uh, resources like not being able to play the game or know or know the full story of what's Well, a lot of that comes from the director. I mean, a lot of we get a, a lot of the information from the director, and uh, you know, then oftentimes with video games, uh, there's quite a few people that usually show up in the room. Uh, the representatives, of, like, especially if it's you know something like Kingdom Hearts, you know you'll get uh, producers like the people who have developed the game for years and they know the whole history of it. Um, so they'll give you oftentimes right there and then. You know I don't get the scripts in advance. Sometimes um, you just get the information. And you're told this is what's happening, uh, and you immediately have to jump right in and, and create that reality. And so um, I think the biggest thing about voiceover, uh, acting in general, you have to have a vivid imagination. You have to completely be able to create the, you know, what is happening and, and the reality for yourself and shut out everything that's going on around you. Um, and your imagination is the most important uh, part of that. But with voiceover, it's, it's doubly so. Um, you really have to be able to visualize, you know, when, for example, tuxedo mask, that my tuxedo suddenly appears on me, and I'm, you know, floating in the air and throwing roses, and you really have to visualize, like, if you're being attacked, like, what that, you know, the, the impact of, like, uh, 
you know, sometimes it's something weird that's hitting you. It's, uh, you know, it's like icicles or something. So that might hit you a different way. And you have to really be able to kind of visualize what that, how that might affect, you know, an impact on you as opposed to just a standard punch or, you know, and so that is, it's, it's uh, as I said, that, that is doubly important. And, um, and sometimes we don't get too much information. We don't get a lot of time to prepare. You know, you walk in a room, they're like, here's what's happening, go. <laughs> You're like, whoa, wait a second. I, I need a minute just to figure all that out, all that detail. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys a story. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. Do you guys know who Frank Welker is? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you should know who Frank Welker is. He's a legend. Uh, if you IMDB him, his page, it takes four hours just to get to the bottom of his page. Um, he is, uh, he, is uh, he was uh, an idol of mine when I was growing up um, because he played Freddy in Scooby-Doo. And um, now he plays uh, Scooby-Doo and Freddy. Uh, Don Mezic uh, doesn't do it anymore. And uh, one of my uh, first animated jobs in LA when I moved to Los Angeles from Toronto was I got to do an episode of Scooby-Doo. Um, I was uh, Zeke Zillion, the uh, roadie for um, a Canadian band, and we're on the road. What the hell are they called? Uh, <laughs> um, oh my God, I, I'm terrible at remembering things. It's so it's so rude. They were their Canadian rock band is. Uh, oh my God, I can't think. They're from Montreal. It's gone out of my head. Anyways, I'm their roadie, and it turns out that myself and a whole bunch of other little characters, you know, we're trying to stop them from getting to their show because we have a band and we want to replace them, and so we're the bad guys, right? Um, and uh, in, in it, it was the, uh, we're, we're pretending to be this invisible madman to try and kidnap all the members of the band to stop them from getting there. And in that episode, Frank Walker was uh, Scooby, Freddy, and he also played the invisible madman. So in one scene, this guy, it was unreal, I'll never forget. In one scene, the invisible madman is attacking uh, Shaggy on the edge of a cliff, and then Scooby jumps in and starts to try and stop him from attacking Shaggy. Frank does the entire scene in one pass. In one pass by himself. And I swear to God, I remember watching him and thinking, it sounds like he's overlapping right now. It sounds like two characters are speaking at the same time or fighting at the same time. I'm like, that's not possible. <laughs> Nobody can actually make multiple sounds with their voice. Like, it was so incredible. Like, there was no lapse between, like, you know, like, Scooby, like, <laughs> you know, and then, then, like, the Invisible Mad Men's like, Rawr! and they're fighting back and forth. It was unreal. It was like a four-minute, four five-minute scene that just went from beginning to end with no pauses. Um, so you talk about imagination and the ability to really, the detail that that takes and the separation and the ability to manipulate your voice to create you know, such a distinct character like Scooby, such a distinct character like, uh, sorry, I meant Freddy. He was attacking Freddy, right? You can play Shaggy. Shaggy was played by um, Casey Kasem, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, that was an honor too. He's a legend. He's a legend, it was so cool. Uh, to meet him and Oh yeah, you guys know, do you guys know who Casey Kasem is? Reach for the stars! Yeah, right on, he's a legend. Um, he was also Robin in Justice League with, uh, you know, uh, Batman and Robin. Um, and, and so anyways, that, uh, that's my story of voice acting. When you, when you see some of the greats, like Frank Walker, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. And uh, your imagination is everything in our world, in what we do. Speaking of Frank Walker and Casey... Apparently she didn't enjoy that story. Uh, <laughs> oh. no, <I'm> just <laughs> Articles, speaking of... Not a fan of Frank Walker, I understand. Speaking of people like Fred Walker and especially Casey Casey Kasem, I grew up, especially I've worked in radio, I have mad respect for Casey Kasem. And America's top people, 40, Casey uh, Kasem. Yes. He's the greatest man, he's great. Yes, <laughs> and what is it like working with some of those legends of, of the business because like, I used to work in radio absolutely have respect for him Rick Dees yeah. people like that what is it like going to a studio that those people have made history in and knowing you're doing the same thing what, what, does it ever go through your Go through your mind. Um, uh, yes, of course. I mean, you know, there are moments. Uh, I'm a kid. My, you know, the, the kid in you always comes out when you, you know, when you think back to when you're little and you go, "This is what I want to do. This is what I dream of doing." And then all of a sudden, one day, you're standing in a studio with these people that have, you know, such an influence in your life. Uh, it is always amazing. But 
as well, though, the, you know, the professional in you and the actor in you comes out and you get the job done and you kind of get to work and you, you know, and, and, um, and you get more and more used to it, you know, as you, as you work in the industry. I've worked with a lot of um, big stars and stuff and, uh, and I would say 90% of them are just, you know, like myself, like all of you, we're just regular people, you know, we, we eat, sleep, we get, you know, go to work, we pay our bills, we love, we laugh, we cry. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I always think of that when I'm meeting those kinds of people that, you know, they're just, we're, we're all doing our jobs, we're all in this boat together and, and uh, you know, and, uh, but absolutely, when, uh, for me, people like Casey Kasem and Frank Walker, are really, you know, it's such a, an honor. I, I'm actually friends with Jim Cummings, who's Winnie the Pooh, I'm friends with uh, and Tigger, and uh, I'm friends with, uh, you know, Billy West, who's like, you know, was an icon to me, Ren and Stimpy, Futurama, you know, a good friend of mine is Phil Lamar, who's, you know, done, done you name it, Phil's been everything, he's, yeah, he's at uh, Futurama, like, you know, one of my best friends, Carlos Alves Rocky, who's, uh, you know, Fairly Odd Parents, Rocco's Modern Life. Yeah. Uh, Carlos is a legend, he was the Taco Bell Chihuahua, you get a Taco Bell. <laughs> He's, he's great, man. It, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny because we're all, you know, at the end of the day, we're all working stiffs too. You know yeah, what I mean? We yeah. get up in the morning, we go to work, <laughs> but uh, sometimes you're not feeling well and you got a cold, and you're like, I gotta get my voice up here, and uh, I can't get my voice much higher than this. Yeah. <laughs> Questions. Um, the first one is, uh, you like apparently you like to play the villains more than the than the good guys. Why do you like to play the villains more than the good guys? And also, have you ever met uh, Samuel Vincent? I have not met Samuel. Not Vincent. the uh, he's a voice actor too. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Um, <laughs> he's Sorry. Me, I, I don't know who that is. <laughs> oh wow. Sorry. He's kidding. I hope I didn't bring you home. Oh. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. Just, um, just, but just, part like, of the, just because he's from Canada doesn't mean he knows everybody who is Canadian. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, then of course I know. No. <laughs> you should have just said his first name. We don't use the last names in Canada. We, all, you know, we just go by first names. You say Vincent up there and everybody's like, right, it's Carazza. They don't even say Carazza. They just know who I am. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, your question was why do I like playing villains more than heroes or more than good guys? Um, just because they're more fun. I mean, let's be honest, right? Who doesn't want to cause? Who does? Who doesn't want to cause trouble and get away with murder? Although we never get away with murder. We never get away with it. Drat, spoiled again. Um, not, not even in Canada. Uh, uh, there's there is no crime in Canada. What are you talking about? <laughs> Hey, listen, eh? you know, up there, eh? we don't, we don't have any crime. You know, we just play hockey. We settle it on the ice. You know? you know, hey? Listen, man. All we, all we do is if you, you and me got a beef, we put some skates on, we grab a hockey stick. You know, we put our toques on, get a beer. Just, just going, man. Just you know don't, ever say, don't ever say their Don't ever say their beer. Don't ever say their Let's get it done. Uh, <laughs> no, our villains are just awesome, right? Who doesn't love a villain? Um, there's also, uh, oftentimes for me, I think part of the reason too I enjoy playing villains, um, I don't want to say more, that's, that's an unfair thing, and there's not, there's, it's always fun to play a hero too, and, um, and fans tend to love the heroes more and, and, and you know, root for the heroes, so that's always fun, you love to see people <laughs> like the characters that you play. Uh, I've, I've played some pretty nasty characters on camera too that is it, always tough, I remember I did this movie where, um, I was a rapist in it, and um, yeah, I was just, uh, it was for CBS, um, and, um, and I remember the cast, the rest of the cast didn't really want to associate with me during the shoot box, so, like they kind of isolated me, which I understand, for them it was hard, right, like, you know, the girl that I have to rape in the movies, she didn't want to really get to know me or, you know, be fun, and fr I mean, it was, we were, like it was nice, but it just, it wasn't like she just didn't want to sit with me at lunch and like have a casual conversation and then 20 minutes later we have to do, you know, some horrible scenes and it's just, you know, so, uh, so, um, you know, sometimes that's not fun playing the villain because then you get, you kind of get pushed to the side. People are like, I don't want to talk to him, he's an asshole. Um, and, and you're like, but I'm not, I'm a really nice guy. 
Um, but also, I think with villains, um, you get to explore things that you yeah. don't normally do in real life. You know, the, uh, especially vocally, uh, uh, in, you know, on microphone, uh, in voiceover, you get to do things where you know you get to take your voices places that you just wouldn't normally do. Heroes are, you know, they're, they're very heroic. You know, they they have very typically they have those voices that just cut through all American. You know? um, or they're, you know, kind of cute and sweet and, you know, up here, but there's nothing like doing a voice down here, you know? there's, there's nothing like being that kind of a guy. Or something crazy! <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. Alright, all right, speaking of doing characters, is there any dream roles that you would love to have? Whether it be voice acting, anything, anything that pays over a million dollars. We would all love those. But re realistically, is there any role that? Re okay, we'll throw the idea of reality out of it. All right. If you could play any role, any movie, or something coming up, what would you want to do? Um, whether it's on stage or, vo or vocally. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, on camera or on, well, on stage, oh man, I mean, of course, I, I got to play Macbeth, I got to play Hamlet, so I would love to go back and do some, you know, theater and do some Shakespeare again, and I missed that actually, and going back and doing stage for that year on the road, boy, it, uh, you, you forget how much that, uh, there's nothing like live theater, there's nothing like being in front of an audience and, and, and performing and connecting with people live, that's just, there's something wonderful about that. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, on stage, uh, in musicals, I, I've always wanted to play the role of uh, Javert in uh, Les Mis. Oh. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's a dream role of mine. Um, I, uh, many, many, many years ago, living in Toronto, uh, I was offered to play the role of Roger and, uh, in Rent, in Rent, yeah, in, in Toronto. Um, and at the time, I was... I have to say that I'm a big fan of the show Rent. Yeah, Rent is a great show. It's a very yes. powerful show. It's a very poignant, powerful, wonderful show that really, you know, really I feel uh, it had a, a huge impact on, on the theater that we watch nowadays, you know, modern theater. Yeah. Um, and also just the story, you know, it's a powerful, powerful story. Um, uh, Jonathan Marshall was brilliant, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I, at the time I was busy doing other things. I was, I was sort of very much focused on my film, TV, and voiceover career, and I just didn't feel like I wanted to take sign a year contract and kind of do that at that point. Um, and so, and then, and then it, it never it never really came back around, and it's kind of one of those biggest regrets too. I would love to have done that, and now. Now I've got the grays starting to come in, and I don't think I'll ever get the chance to play it. <laughs> I could maybe sing it one day, but I would never get the chance to play it. But, you know, I'm a little too old now. They get to get the walker. I'll be there in two more seconds. Uh, so, so musically, I think that's something I'd love to do. Um, I don't think Roger would do good with the walker, especially with Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and uh, on camera, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. I think, I think for me, the, the 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 whole reason I became an actor when I was a little kid was James Bond. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, Skyfall. Oh, oh, no. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the greatest. Uh, I'm a huge James Bond freak. Oh, and and yes, okay. shaking not stiff. Um, speaking yeah, speaking you're, 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 of James you're, Bond, who's the best Bond? Well, in, in your opinion, there's, in your opinion. there's no question, gentlemen. The best bond is Sean Connery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's the great. He's my influence too. That's the that's that's what I grew up watching with Sean uh, Connery and uh, Doctor No and Goldfinger, the two movies that I saw. And I was like, I remember, I, I think I was maybe ten years old. And I watched those movies, and I was like, I want to be a super spy. And then my next thought was, that's not possible. So then I need to be an actor so I can play a super spy. And that's literally how that conversation went in my head at 10 years old. I swear to God, I can still remember it to this day, watching Dr. No on TV. And uh, I actually remember thinking that, going, I want to be a super spy. But thank God I was smart enough to realize that that could not happen. And because uh, that would have been a wasted effort trying to be a super spy. Um, <laughs> And so that's why I became an actor, but I'll never get to play Bond. I'm not British. I mean, you know, it's just not going to happen, you know what I mean? Um, and plus, Daniel Craig is way too hot, right? He's just he's awesome, right? He's awesome. Even my wife says that. You know. So, no, no. 
Yeah, um, but that would be a dream role, of course, to play Bond. I do hope one day, one of my dreams is to maybe be a villain, a Bond villain. That would be cool. Um, and then vocally, uh, voiceover-wise, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I think I've always, I, I would love to play uh, Wolverine. Or Spider Man. Those are my two. Those are two of my favorite characters of all time. And I, I would love to, you know, play uh, do Scooby Doo or, or Shaggy or something like that. Just because they they were such influences on me. Um, but I'm sure there's people out there that do it better than I do. Uh, and one of my dream characters too is the Tasmanian Devil from. Uh, <laughs> How much fun is that? Come on, man. The guy doesn't even say anything. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't, no, no words are needed. He just runs around. It's the best. It's the greatest. Yeah, what's up, Dan? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Duck season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Fire. Oh. <laughs> Alrighty, um, I do want to ask you, do you have any projects that you're working on right now that do not have uh, a, a NDA associated with them that you can talk about? Ah, uh, yes, because this happened yesterday. <laughs> yes, that, that's why I preface the question that way. Well, uh, I'll say again, I do have, I'm, um, uh, I, Assassin's Creed uh, is coming out, uh, I believe, I, I thought it was supposed to be out like now, but I think it's coming out next month, right, in October? Yeah. Assassin's Creed 3, so I'm in that, but I'm not allowed to say who I'm playing yet. Um, I think they have to wait until it gets released. Um, I'm currently working on a, a, a project that's going to be huge and amazing, but again, I'm not allowed to actually mention what it is. I hate those damn non-disclosure agreements, because it's awesome, man. It's just off the hook. It's going to be a great game. Um, but I uh, currently have um, the new Kingdom Hearts uh, game that just came out. It, it came out already, right? Yeah. yeah, it got released. Sorry, I'm not, I don't play, so I, I, I always forget. Uh, and I have a, an amazing project that is going to, it was supposed to launch um, October 16th, and it's, but unfortunately the printers in China got delayed, so it's going to launch, it's going to officially be uh, available to the public November 29th. They're making the launch of it at uh, Comic-Con in New York, which I'll be at. Uh, it's a project called Anomaly, and it's an interactive graphic novel uh, where I, we also did the, the book. We perform the book so that it, you know you can you can almost watch it like a movie, almost like an animated uh, film online. And I played the lead role, of John, in it. And it is uh, it was created by Brian Haberlin, who did Witchblade and Area 51, and uh, was one of the lead animators for Spider-Man for years. It's, the artwork is gorgeous. It's a giant novel. It's a graphic novel. It's it's groundbreaking. It's gonna be the first one of the first of its kind. The book itself, I believe, weighs somewhere between 15 and 25 pounds. Yeah, it's huge. It's like a coffee table. I mean, it's not a coffee table book. It's an actual coffee table. <laughs> uh, you can put legs on it, and then you can put your coffee. It's huge, and it's beautiful. I mean, this is, it's going to blow your minds. And also, it incorporates this thing called augmented reality, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, right? Um, it's sort of like Minority Report, where you can hold your cell phone up to it. Anything that has a camera, your cell phone, an iPad, you can hold that up to it, and the your, your the screen will interact with the novel as you flip pages, and suddenly, like um, you know, characters will jump up in, onto your screen and start attacking your screen as if they're attacking you, and it's pretty it's pretty amazing. You can you can go to experienceanomaly.com, and uh, you can watch like a video, and it's it's pretty fascinating. It's uh, groundbreaking what these guys are doing. The artwork is stunning. I mean, the book when it opens up, the book is probably about three feet across and then the artwork also folds out so certain pieces from the book fold out so long that it's like six feet in length and it's, it's almost like looking at a giant poster and it's just the detail in the artwork is stunning it's beautiful and i'm so honored to be a part of it it's it's a pretty amazing piece all right next question i have is what was the most difficult role you've ever played in in terms of voiceover work oh um <clears throat> I did uh, a couple, I've played some wacky, weird characters in some, some video games like Watchmen, um, and, uh, but in EverQuest, uh, I can't remember, I think it was EverQuest 2. Yeah, I played this, I, I played a whole bunch of like these weird little, you know, like um, villains and soldiers and, and stuff that attacked the lead characters. And, but there was one character in particular, and it was a long day of recording, it was like four hours, and right at the end of it was a Friday, 
And they go, okay, you're gonna play this frog warrior. And I go, okay, uh, frog warrior, right on. Uh, but apparently the frog warriors talk with this kind of muckler cock cock like have gills and stuff and they all cry and he's like so I have to so I'm doing this whole like this you know about I don't know ten pages of dialogue and stuff where you're you're you know you're doing fight scenes and stuff and interacting with the characters and I'm doing this voice and then we have to do the battle stuff like in voiceover you always in the video games you record all your dialogue first then you have to do your your what we call the battle sequences where it's you know you you do a short punch, a middle, uh, a medium punch, a long punch. You do a short jump, a medium jump, a long jump. You know, and you, you get, you take damage. You do short, medium, longs. You do all these different things so that when you guys are playing the games, you know, depending on how hard the strike is, that's how we react. And, and the damage and the battle stuff is hard on your voice. It is very hard on your voice. I mean, it's you know very shocking. But doubly so when you're playing a frog warrior, the top one, and, on, and, and then I got to this scene where I had to die by getting my throat sliced. And it was just unreal, because I'm supposed to have all this blood pouring out of my neck, and I'm like choking, and I ended up, like, I mean, we were recording for four hours, I ended up pretty much losing my voice, and thank God it was a long weekend, because I had to do a session on the Tuesday, and, uh, I had nothing for Saturday and Sunday, so that's, that was one of the toughest things I've done. I've burnt out my voice a few times. Video games are always the hardest because of the damage stuff, just doing all that, the fighting, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's intense. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably the one. Yeah, I was actually about ready to do that right now. All right, uh, yeah, I was gonna have you go up there. All right, we're gonna go ahead and open the Q and A. For uh, we're gonna uh, take a few people, a few questions. If you do not get your question answered today. Or, or right now, come see me. Come see him over where he's doing the autographs at. Come hang out and ask him. I'm sure you'll be more than answer the questions. So signs. All right, just don't judge. Yeah, I'll try to do this. Makes our job easier. Uh, so does anybody have any questions they want to ask? First person. We got a gentleman back there in a yellow banana costume. And uh, I love bananas. What? Sorry. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Uh, how is it working with Little more often? Ah, excellent question. Ah, uh, Oni Mahoney. That was a great film. That's actually a Canadian, based on a Canadian true story. It is? Yeah. Yes, it's based on a true story in Canada of the youngest bank manager in Canadian history. Um, uh, Brian Maloney was his real name, and he uh, embezzled millions of dollars from the CIBC, the Canadian National Bank. Uh, to gamble. He was a gambling addict. Uh, and he went to Atlantic City every weekend and would gamble and, uh, you know, and ended up embezzling millions and millions of dollars. And it's the only time in the history of Atlantic City that they had to shut the city down um, uh, because they actually thought that what he was doing was, they thought it was like uh, mob related. They thought, you know, that he was actually, you know, uh, transferring drugs and money across the border so they shut everything down. So anyways, I worked with Philip Seymour Hoffman. He's an incredible actor. He's a method actor. So that's always interesting. I, I used to, I, I was a method actor when I started in, in film uh, originally. Um, and then I hope this doesn't insult any method actors out there, but then I just kind of sort of went, you know, I could still do what I'm doing, but I don't have to stay in character all day. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier said to Dustin Hoffman in Marathon Man, it's cold acting, my dear boy. Uh, <laughs> so, not to insult Phil, this man is a genius. He was amazing. He is a legend. Uh, working with him was incredible. He is so committed. He's so the detail, but he stays in character all the time. So it's a little tricky because, uh, you know, when the director Richard and I was our second movie together, I did another movie with him called Love and Death on Long Island with Jason Priestley, and um, it was our second movie together. And uh, so, you know, when Richard would say cut, Philip doesn't exactly cut. He's still in the scene, you know what I mean? So, uh, but it, it, it was a fascinating piece. He's a really, really uh, intense guy. You know, on days when we had more fun scenes to do and casual scenes that weren't so intense, he was really fun and friendly and we'd like talk sports and stuff. And then on days where he had really heavy scenes, it's just like, I'll, I'll be over here. Just call me when you need me, man. <laughs> like, he's, you know. Because he's a method actor, but he's he's awesome. He's a, a very you know he's a really nice guy and uh, and he's an incredible actor. You know, yeah. 
I'm sure you're a fan, I take it? Yeah, who isn't, right? You guys are amazing. You guys are incredible. What's that? The Masters movie that's coming out, I've heard of it. I haven't actually. The Masters? I haven't heard of it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm. Oh, right, it's in a, a red eye. Oh, cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, I'm sure. They're, they, everything they've done is amazing. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah? We're going to go ahead and get the people we're saying live. To do questions? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. we're going to do a lineup, I guess, to ask questions. Okay, Ruben, yeah. go ahead. What's up, brother? Uh, anyway, Vincent, uh, have, you, have you heard of, if, like, since you've done, like, since you've done uh, Mama Mia uh, and other stuff, uh, have, have you uh, what was your favorite, um, did you listen to some concept records like, you know, Pink Floyd to the Wall, Judas Priest, Nostradamus, Clean Drives, Operation Mind Crime? Um, which one can you remember, like, listening to, like, like um, back then? And if, if you've heard Operation Mind Crime, who would, if they ever turned into a stage show, who would you, or who would you want to audition for, Nikki or Dr. X? <laughs> awesome question. I have no idea. I've never heard of Operation Mind Crime. I've, I do know Queen's Reich, um, so I don't know which character I would want to audition for. Um, but uh, it sounds like it would make a great musical because I can see you're passionate about it. Um, so I, sorry to disappoint you, but I don't. I don't know. I'm not a big Queen's Reich guy. So I, I've heard their music. I like them. Judas Priest. I grew up listening to. They're awesome. What about the Who? The Who? Tommy. Yeah. Who doesn't love Tommy. the Who? Man? Tommy. Yes, Tommy's an awesome musical. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. He asked if, if I knew that. Uh, I don't know if you guys know. I'm sure most of you know that they're making a new uh, episodes of Sailor Moon. They're, yeah. they're bringing it back in Japan. Um, and he asked if I had the opportunity, would I want to play uh, Tuxedo Mask again? Or audition for it? Absolutely not, man. Are you kidding me? I'm not auditioning for it. Just, just, I'm, I'm Vince Garaza. Are you kidding me? Audition? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not out of here. Somebody call my agent. Uh, you, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, I would, I'd be honored to play Tuxedo Mask again. And uh, maybe you guys can write to those people and tell them that you want people like myself back to play the role. Um, you, you'd be amazed at how much the producers of shows and, and video games, how much they listen. Um, you know, I've seen friends. I've, uh, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm, I live in LA and I'm friends with uh, you know most almost every VO actor there, and it's you know in video games and stuff. And, and you'd be surprised. Like we often hear rumors of like, okay, they were gonna place us, or they're gonna bring in a star to do things because now things get, you know, they get more famous, and then they're like, okay, we're gonna bring in like Hugh Jackman. And then fans, you know, when you guys write in and you guys say, no, man, we love this and we like it the way it is, sometimes they, they just scrap the whole idea and they go, Brett, we'll stick with the people that the fans love, you know? So I would love to do it again. And I know every side, I was just up in Vancouver doing a convention last month with um, uh, some of the Sailor Moon people, Katie Griffin, who played Sailor Mars, uh, Susan Roman, who played Sailor Jupiter, uh, Terry Hawks, who played Sailor Moon, uh, Ron Rubin was there, who played Artemis, um, and we were all hanging out. Oh, and uh, Sugar Lynn Beard was there, who played uh, Rini. And uh, all, I mean, we got that question asked a lot, and all of us have said, of course, we'd love to do it again. Um, the, it, our cast was awesome. They're a great, such great people and such great voice actors up in Canada, so it would be a pleasure to do it. I, I hope they do. I also don't know why we never made the last season. You know, we never dubbed the last season. You know, I don't know why that happened. You know. Can I ask a quick follow-up question to that? Yeah. What do, What do you think about when sh uh, when shows like that bring in a big name celebrity to to replace a, a voice actor? Do you think it, it uh, kind of ruins the quality of it? Like, first, like, take a Broadway show. You bring in a big name who may not be that that good, but they're doing more for the name recognition. Do you think that that degrades the quality of the work? Uh, do, do you see what I mean by that? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, we we often grapple, you know. Uh, that concept and that question you know look if i was to be lucky enough to become a celebrity i, I hope that people wouldn't suddenly start to dismiss my work just because i was a celebrity so i, I think that's unfair to always 
to sometimes make that the accusation that a celebrity degrades the work. I mean, they usually become who they are because they're good at what they do. It all depends on the celebrity. If they're bringing in Paris Hilton to play, you know, to do Mamma Mia, then I'd probably have a problem with that. <laughs> um, if they suddenly ask Kim Kardashian to play the voice of Sailor Moon, thank you, thank you. I would probably have a major problem with that too. Um, so I never have an issue, I, I've never had an issue whatsoever with the concept of a star or a celebrity um, getting a job. Uh, our business is a business. It's called the acting business uh, because it has to make money. What we do, if it doesn't make money, then there's no way that we can keep doing what we do. So I get it. I get why producers and directors and make those choices. If fans, you know, I mean, listen, who's not excited about the Les Mis movie, right? I am. Who's not excited about that? I mean, come on, Hugh Jackman, Russell Crowe. I mean, it's a, it's a killer cast. They're all phenomenal actors. They're all wonderful singers. Every one of them, every one of them deserves those roles. So they're all superstars, and I'm sure that there's, I mean, I personally know hundreds of amazing singers and actors who are not celebrities, but I get why they make those choices. So I never have an issue with that kind of stuff. I do have an issue when they, what we like to in the business call stunt casting. When they, they make a change to something and they bring someone in or they try to, they try to change the role or they try to, you know, uh, stunt cast it, like bring someone in who just has a name, who's maybe not right for that role, just because they want the name value. And that's always, I think it's, dis I think all you guys feel the same way, it's disappointing the fans. You don't want something that dilutes the, the quality of the, of the game, or the animation, or the movie, or the stage play. What we always want to see is the best person up there doing an amazing job, right? And, and, and just, you know, making us care about those characters. Um, and sometimes they just, you know, hey listen, sometimes we just get it wrong. We get cast and stuff and we're, you know, when you sit there and you go, man, I, they shouldn't have hired me. <laughs> I'm not the right guy for this. Um, luckily, I don't think I've ever had to say that. But, you know, it, just, it, it happens. I mean, it's like people criticize Pierce Brosnan doing Mamma Mia the movie. You know, and it wasn't the greatest. I, I'm a major fan of Pierce Brosnan, and I mean, he was James Bond. He's a legend. Uh, it, and and I wouldn't. Fault, I'm sure they offered him the role, and I wouldn't fault him for taking that role. He, I'm sure, as an actor, you like to challenge yourself. You like to push yourself to go further. You like to try to do things sometimes that you aren't certain that you can do. And that's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how you know we become better. Sometimes failing is the best way to, be, to become better. So I have no issues with. We have time for about two more questions. Okay, yeah. After that, we're going to have to send uh, the rest of the questions over here. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, speaking of Mamma Mia, I was meaning to ask, when did you tour? Like, uh, I toured, let's see, uh, we've been home from uh, almost two years exactly. So it would have been 2009 to 2010. Did you ever come here? Like, uh, I played... Uh, we, uh, not, not this area, we played Lubbock, I played Lubbock, Texas, I played Amarillo, I actually got to play hockey in Amarillo, which was kind of cool, yeah, the theater was attached to the, uh, the theater was attached to the ice rink, and so, the Amarillo Gorillas, uh, I'll never forget that, I got to put on skates and play hockey in Amarillo, um, which was kind of funky. Uh, I played uh, San Antonio, beautiful city, I played uh, Dallas, uh, uh, yep, we played St. Oh, Louis. The yep, we played the Fox. Yeah, I played the Fox. We played a lot of the Foxes in uh, Georgia and Atlanta. Um, but I've never gotten down to South Texas. And yeah, so I, was, I was wondering because I actually seen Mama Mia about two years ago with my mom. And it was here in South. Uh, it was. It was McAllen. It was McAllen. Yeah. Yeah. It was really good. Was Unfortunately, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> My wife was doing it in Vegas at the time, and that's where I was visiting her in Vegas, and then that's, that's how we ended up doing it, is they asked her to go out on the tour, and um, I just remember thinking it was already tough enough to keep seeing each other every week to drive to Vegas, back and forth to Vegas, so I auditioned just so that we could be together, and uh, they ended up giving me the job, and we uh, toured for a year, which was amazing. I, I, you know, I, I have to say that it was one of the fa my favorite things ever to, to, do, to be on stage with my wife, but also... I'm a Canadian, so I got to see so much of America. Like we got to play, you know. Uh, what role did your wife play? Um, she actually understudied Donna, Tanya, and Rosie. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, yeah, she understood them for uh, in Vegas and on the tour. Um, yeah, yeah, she's incredibly talented. I got to see the uh, you know so many sites like like seeing amazing cities like San Antonio and Mount Rushmore and something that is amazing. Sorry, right, now next question. I just want to know uh, how did the role of the Tiger Mask on Batter and did you have a hard time getting the part? Um, actually, it's, that's a really interesting question because I started out in uh, Sailor Moon. I was hired originally to play Alan uh, in the Doom Tree series. Yeah, I played Alan. Um, uh, what was my sister's name? Does anybody remember? Anne. Anne. There you go. Anne. I answered my own question. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Alan and Anne in the Doom Tree series. So that's how I got into it. And actually, my uh, acting teacher in, uh, in Ryerson, my, my microphone technique teacher in Ryerson, was the director at the time. So he brought me in and I played Alan in that section of it. Uh, at the time, uh, Reno Romano started as Tuxedo Mask for the first 10 episodes, I believe it was. And then Toby Proctor took over when Reno, Reno moved to LA. And so Toby Proctor took over for, I can't remember how many episodes. And then at some point, they just decided they wanted to make a change. Uh, I don't really know what that was about or why. And then they asked me to uh, if I would take over the role. So I didn't really, it didn't really, it was weird because we actually had these questions up in Vancouver last month with the Sailor Moon cast. And it was so interesting to hear everybody else's stories about how they got the roles. But my story is kind of odd, odd because I didn't actually audition and I didn't, you know, know that that was going to happen. They just kind of came and said, do you want to do this? And I'm like, you know, yeah, they brought me in. I was already playing other stuff and, you know, and Alan. And so they brought me in and just kind of had me do one reading to see if it would work. They liked it, and that was the rest of history. Did you have a favorite, like, phrase throughout the seasons? Like, you know, that's, that sucks about Tuxedo Mask. I just, he, he speaks for forever, which, as you guys probably know in this panel, that's why I got the role, because I never shut up. Um, my wife's favorite thing with me is this, which means wrap it up, honey, wrap it up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Tuxedo Mask doesn't have, he doesn't have any phrases. He doesn't do, like, you know, moon prison power. You know, <laughs> He just what he go he just goes on for hours with his poetic speeches that you know like you know and half the time I remember saying them and just being like does this even make sense <laughs> like does anybody understand what this guy's talking about he's throwing roses and he's pulling poetry and I'm like, what's happening here man but uh, yeah he doesn't really have I, know, I I just one of the from promise of the rose I, I always remember that uh, nothing good can ever grow in a garden full of darkness. Remember that right, phrase, which actually made sense. You know, that was one of those times where he actually made sense. Um, although, if I could clarify, I don't know that anything can grow in a garden full of flowers. <laughs> so once again, it was one of them. Thank you guys for coming out, and I'll be uh, I'll be doing my job.